translational medicine is really a, a discipline or, or that is really focused on looking at how we take these discoveries in the basic science world or the bench or fundamental discoveries and how do we move them in a safe and effective and expeditious manner um, from those discoveries to being able to being tested for potential human use for the benefit of, uh, against uh, diseases and ultimately as therapies. There are 63 number of institutions that collectively have participated with the National Center for Translational Science. And now they have determined that the speed is too slow. So in this phase, we are tasked to figure out as this train starts a journey from either point, community, clinic, or basic lab, why does it take so long? And why is it so costly to reach the patient? They call it there must be mountains that needs to be removed or tunnels dug through them, or there are bridges that needs to be built over the rivers. That now is called translational science. The former one was translational research. So translational science make the translational research more efficient, more effective, and more informative. It takes a very long time and a lot of different individuals to actually move things all the way from a thought or discovery to, um, to actually a therapeutic. Two brains always work better than one. The science has become so expanse and so deep that it is almost impossible for a single person to have access in terms of knowledge and access in terms of expertise in all of them. So instead of spending time and learning and being able to, to be able to do all those yourself, it is much better to collaborate and bring the expertise together. And that's what we call team science. And MCW has the lead on team science through its mechanism called the Integrated Team Science-Based Clinical and Research Ensemble, which brings the patient, patient advocacy, basic science researchers, clinical researchers, community members, all together to address an unmet patient need. It is imperative for frontline community providers and researchers to be on the same accord. Um, there's, uh, as you know, there is a void of communication and there's a void and large opportunity for various interventions to be developed and, and implemented, but we're just not there yet because of the void and the large chasm between uh, both academia and um, communities with lived experience. The KL2 is an early career mentor development funding mechanism that's internal to the institution that serves as a mechanism for early career faculty to start their research programs before going on to apply for external federally funded or other funding mechanisms. We currently have three scholars in this program. Uh, one of our scholars is looking at the epidemiology of injury and injury patterns that may relate to um, events and social media trends. So that's one of those projects. The second one is actually looking at developing a shared decision-making tool uh, for individuals who've had traumatic brain injury, uh, particularly older adults. And then a third is actually a clinical trial uh, looking at uh, ways to stratify patients uh, who have multiple myeloma uh, for therapies. So the project um, that my KL2 is um, working towards is related to traumatic injury and the context of traumatic injury. And that's injury broadly, so a fall, a motor vehicle crash, a firearm related injury, really any type of injury. And the motivation for this project comes from my graduate training. I was looking at outcomes after injury and exposure to violence, mostly in the brain, that were related to risk or resilience for various mental health outcomes like post-traumatic stress disorder or depression related kinds of disorders. We are looking at the neural underpinnings in the brain of those outcomes, but they're a bit far removed from actually implementing any change um, in the actual 
patient population of interest. When I came to MCW, I pivoted a little bit more to the epidemiology side of researching traumatic injury and trying to understand what confers risk for injury in the first place. And are there specific things about the environment that may increase or decrease risk for injury and also the outcomes after injury as well. In the translational research, the main focus was on the research enterprise and community who do the research. Now, everybody needs to participate to make this process efficient and effective. We invited people from a variety of disciplines. So I was trained as a neuroscientist um, and a data scientist, so I have more of the quantitative background in research, but I'm not a clinician. I'm not an epidemiologist, so we invited both of those kinds of people. We have a nurse practitioner on the adult side at Freydert Hospital. We have a pediatric trauma surgeon as two clinicians and also a trauma psychologist. So we have kind of the whole clinical representation across the lifespan and from the medical and um, psych psychiatric side. The perspective that I bring to this research project is truly the voice of the community, as well as an academic and um, a, a background of health equity and understanding what voices aren't at the table. The perspective that I bring to the research that Dr. Tomas is doing is really the bedside and clinical perspective. So we have a lot of databases and information in charts and all that kind of stuff on paper about trauma patients. But what we don't always have is what really happens to them. What is their experience? And if there's a difference between looking at, you know, the statistics surrounding an injury and what that injury actually looks like and is like for the patient in real life. Forming an ensemble, I think, is really important to scientific research. Um, it's, it was a new topic to me when I first started it, but having been through the process now, I think it's really um, been fruitful um, and has really pushed um, the goals of the project farther than they could have had we not had an ensemble. The benefits of the, the integrated clinical and research ensembles is really bringing together individuals who have an interest in the same problem or the same gap in knowledge. Um, but come at it from very different understandings and angles so that you get an understanding of what the clinician is dealing with and what the patients deal with, what the community is dealing with. So when we're all together talking about things, we feed off each other's insights. Carissa, Dr. Tomas will say something that I had never seen in that way because she is very data science driven and looking at, you know, kind of the numbers and how they interact and sometimes that will shift my perspective. The importance of collaboration between frontline providers and researchers is simply that, is that they're connected, that we have the opportunity to disseminate meaningful information, to make interventions, and to ensure that everyone's health is impacted, especially the most vulnerable communities. Dr. Tomas is looking at just a bigger picture. How do we use all of the information that's contained in charts, even some of the less formal aspects of it, you know, not just an injury count or this surgery goes with this injury or we expect this kind of outcome with this type of patient or injury, but she's looking at the words that people are using in their documentation of how traumas happen and how traumas are followed through the hospital. And I think that we will develop some really, really interesting insights from that. I hope further attention to injury prevention comes out of this project. I also hope that there's health and betterment for all communities, especially those that are most vulnerable. What CTSI benefited from is AHW support for scholars, has given us the opportunity to train the next generation of well-equipped well-educated clinical and translational researchers and that is starting to bear fruit.